The goal of the video for Beneath the Savage Sun is to raise awareness of endangered elephants. Slash partnered with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and he joins us now. Slash, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, what is up? Cool. <laughs> so cool to be here. Yeah, man. How did you get involved with this fight to help save the endangered elephants? Well, I've known uh, the people at IFA, which is International uh, Fund for Animal Welfare. And for a long time, because I'm a big sort of animal enthusiast and activist and whatnot. And we wrote this song last time we were in South Africa uh, about the plight of the elephant. And it was written from an elephant's point of view and, you know, pretty poignant lyrics about what they're going through. And so I thought, well, if I'm gonna do, we should do a real video, like something that, that really s sort of gives you an idea of what, they're, what, it, what it really looks like. And um, then I, I called IFA and said, I'm going to do this video. Do you guys want to get involved? And so we sort of teamed up and, you know, here we are. Here, here, <laughs> you know, it's there. interesting. A lot of Americans slash don't realize how important this fight for the survival of elephants is mm -hmm. and why anti-poaching is so important. Uh, I used to work in Africa and we went on patrol with some U.S. Marines because they realized, for example, that in some cases, 40% of the ivory trade goes to fund terrorist groups like Al Shabaab. Right, Kenya. it makes total sense. Right. And, and I mean, we have ivory and a lot of things that we just don't pay attention to and we take it for granted, but we're really like the second largest ivory consumer. And I think that uh, the average person, if they knew really what was going on behind the scenes, would not want to purchase ivory. And if once we, you know, a call to action in the States will change the, the significantly change the whole thing. Well, yeah. the statistics are shocking because an elephant is killed every 15 minutes yeah. for its ivory. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that you've gone to Africa a few times. One of the last times you went, you brought your children. Right. How did that impact them, seeing that firsthand? Um, well, you know, they, 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 they know elephants from the zoo and they know uh, from TV and, and whatever, cartoons and magazines. But to see them out in the bush, and which is just so massive and majestic, mm -hmm. and see elephants in a herd sort of traveling, it's just mind-blowing for them. And for me, just to see the look in their eyes, you know. And it was people, very, very cool. And people don't realize, um, I watched this BBC documentary and there was a scene where a mother essentially had to stay with her baby who couldn't make the mm. trek across the plains to the next watering mm. hole. And as the baby started to die, the mother was sort of trying to Aww. urge it to yeah. stand up. And then she cried. And you could see the tears rolling down her face. They're, it was the most heartbreaking thing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, they're super intelligent, highly emotional. You know, they, they have these family groups that last for generations. And there's a matriarch. And there's the whole, you know, all the way down to the youngest. And they take care of themselves. And they mourn their dead. And I think if, if an elephant actually could turn around and actually speak, People would be, um, you know, really shocked to see just how sensitive and intuitive they are. How rewarding has Beneath the Savage Sun been for you as a as a songwriter um, to go ahead and, and have that released? It was nice because uh, um, I don't think I've ever touched on a subject like that in a rock and roll song. Uh -huh. And and Miles wrote the lyrics. And it was something that we'd been talking about, and I'd written all this music, and we uh -huh. put the two together. And it was a great feeling to actually produce something that said what we wanted to say and be able to put it in the midst of everything else that we do. And it's a really cool song. The video is great, but it's it's a little bit graphic. It's a little bit stark, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, I, I like the fact that we can do our bit to sort of raise awareness on the subject. Let me ask you now, let's turn to some rock and roll. Uh, you've been, I mean, it's funny too. I think, I, I wonder, I was saying this to Ryan, our, our floor director, that I, it must be for you when people ask you about Sweet Child of Mine in Paradise City, and you're like, dude, that was like 25 years ago. Well, we still do, play do, it. Do you still play it though, yeah, right? Yeah. And it doesn't bother you when people say, hey, can you play, you know, one of the oldies but goodies? Because they really, right. it's sort of like asking Paul McCartney about, I saw you standing there. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I suppose when it comes, like doing it in the set is fun. For a long time, I didn't play those songs. And so just in the last five years, I started playing them again. And so that's great. When people ask you about it, sometimes it sounds a little bit redundant, but I'm very you know, proud of the sort of Guns N' Roses legacy and everything that that band accomplished and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the songs that we did and, and all that. So I, I try not to ever get annoyed by it. You, know? <laughs> you mentioned on CBS this morning that the tension uh, among Guns N' Roses is gone. Yeah, there's no animosity going on. With what this. happened there? Um, I think it's just, you know, over time, I think we all just got sick and tired of, you know, this sort of sort of black cloud that really didn't, you know, I think uh, the, the biggest thing is, that happens, especially when you have a, a breakup, that 
is a little less than harmonious. Um, you just build up a lot of bad energy because of the distance. You know, when you don't communicate or, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You start, and it's just whatever, whatever the bad feelings were, they just get exaggerated. And I think it just got to reach a point where it was r ridiculous, you know? And Slash, you, you're considered one of the greatest rock guitarists ever, but you also, you're also <clears throat> known for your incredible riffs. When you were growing up, did you sort of have like, I mean, for me, I, I think about like Immigrant Song or yeah. even like Sir Duke, like there's just yeah. riffs that are so cool that they stay with you, smoke on the water. Did you have one that, that sort of? I think uh, I, was, I was attracted to riffs in general, you know, um, from, you know, like the Beatles all the way, you know, the Beatles, and there was always these sort of single, single note hooks that yeah. I was always attracted to. But I mean, I always loved Black Dog from Zeppelin. Yeah, Black I always Dog. loved Back in the Saddle <laughs> from Aerosmith. I always loved Rock Bottom from UFO. Nice. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Right. Yeah. But you also are influenced by things like, like you know, jazz music yeah. and and soul music. There, yeah. there are riffs there too. It's just yeah, that it's it's. I mean, there's a lot of really really great melodies and sort of uh, yeah riffy type things in all different kinds of music. And um, sometimes they're done with a chord or you know three note chords or two note chords yeah. or whatever. But uh, it's just it really it's a hook. Yeah. It's a, a sort of quick melody that repeats itself that you reach a crescendo and then it comes in and you're like oh yeah, yeah. that's cool like yeah. safari in on your last album yeah that was I mean, oh, it's an instrumental which yeah. you don't yeah. usually don't well we never came up with any words for it so we just said <laughs> we'll just jam it yeah. that's awesome slash thank you thank so, you so much. much man yeah. so cool. nice talking to you we are very excited to have you thanks, thanks a lot